Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I think uh, it was a very good uh, point uh, to end the uh, three speeches because what you have done is to remind us that technology has provided us both enormous opportunities but at the same time many challenges and I think it goes back to what technology is today. Technology is a huge liberating force. It has uh, uh, helped the process of globalization, whether you consider it positive or negative, it has helped that process. It has uh, enhanced the process of democratization. It has enhanced the process of decentralization and in so doing, changed the, the models of uh, not just doing business, but also how people, businesses, interact with uh, each other. And at the same time, and I think this goes back to a point which uh, Andrew made, that uh, governments uh, have difficulties dealing with this because uh, this is, uh, has no boundaries and uh, governments tend to operate within national silos. But the dilemma for us is if you try to over-regulate, if, uh, govern if governments of the world band together, go into overdrive, set up a big UN organization to regulate, that may very well kill the goose that uh, laid the golden egg. So I think this is, I think, one of the interesting challenges these new technological uh, trends uh, pose for us. So on that note, thanking the speakers, could I invite uh, comments uh, from the floor? Can I make uh, one request? Uh, Andrew is going to leave us in about uh, half an hour's time, so if you've got uh, questions which you'd like to direct to Andrew, do so now. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Steve Corman from Arizona State University, and I'm here as a distinguished visiting fellow at RSIS, lecturing on government strategic communication. And I'd like to thank you for an interesting panel uh, and pose a question to, to the entire panel that involves what I think is something of a paradox in new media, and under that I include uh, social media and mobile media and so forth. Uh, and the paradox is this. Um, on the one hand, as Mr. Shang pointed out, um, these media create unprecedented opportunities for spontaneous um, organizing, social organizing. And that creates, under some circumstances, the potential for erosion uh, of the government capability for social control. Uh, and some examples of that are the London riots uh, this spring, uh, the Arab Spring, or the, this summer I mean uh, the Arab Spring, uh, at least from the pot potentials of the governments in power, the Iranian protests, um, and so forth. On the other hand, uh, new media provide an unprecedented opportunity f uh, for uh, surveillance. So, uh, as I believe was the, the case in the London riots, we can start looking to try to find out who is sending the text messages that are, are, are fueling the protests. So, what I'm wondering is, um, it seems like that presents the possibility for sort of an Orwellian vicious cycle. So, there's a social grievance that leads to organizing, uh, that prompts the government to implement surveillance, which uh, to reassert control, and that potentially aggravates the grievance uh, in, a first, in the first place, uh, that, that started things in the first place, sort of uh, creating a situation where uh, things spiral out of control. So uh, number one, do you agree that's something we should worry about? And presuming you do, uh, what kind of steps should we take to prevent something like that from happening? Thank you. Uh, perhaps I will start uh, first with James Dorsey because this uh, speaks to what happened in the Middle East in the so-called uh, Arab Spring. Then I'll just move down the line. If I may, just <clears throat> before I come to, to your question, just come back to your remark or comment on, on my thing, and I thank you for that comment. I agree with you, actually. But uh, the one caveat I would say is governments and bureaucracies are not nimble, flexible organizations. They do not change easily. They do not adapt easily. However, there are many governments do have it in them to do so. It's the, mo the most autocratic ones, and the, the, those are the ones one finds maybe primarily in the Middle East and North Africa are the ones who can't. But just that, that was just in response to your comment. Uh, in response to your question, my, in a sense, my question back is, what has qualitatively changed? With other words, surveillance has always been there. Um, wiretapping of telephones. And the question really was, what was your regulatory framework 
what were the ground rules that governed whether or not you could survey or trace. Obviously, the internet may have, a new technology may have made that a lot easier, but is it, in some ways it's much more of a quantitative rather than a qualitative thing. I think in terms of the Arab Spring, um, the surveillance was there 24-7, with and without the new technology. Uh, and if anything, what the new technology did, simply because of its speed and because of its breadth, was allow to some degree uh, a way of circumventing the, um, the surveillance, particularly because, coming back to what my comment was on, on Peter's comment and my comment, uh, <laughs> particularly because these regimes simply were very slow on the uptake, if at all. With other words, this was a, an area they had not entered in, and therefore it was an area where the protesters, to some degree, had free reign, at least for a limited period of time. That has changed, and I would agree with you on that. Uh, wow. Uh, so you're from Arizona State, so my good friend Dan Gilmore, uh, I think, has done some tremendous work in this particular area, who's, who's a professor there too. I am not quite as pessimistic. Uh, I, I think that, I mean, there's a couple of different ways of approaching this. Um, certainly one of them is around surveillance, like, for example, what happened if I believe it was in Tunisia, where the government came in and hijacked uh, HTTP connections, basically the unencrypted web connections, and, and were sort of um, phishing people's usernames and passwords. Uh, the long and the short of it was they were trying to find out protesters' uh, social networks by actually hacking into the networks. And so uh, because they also controlled the ISP, even though they didn't control the um, uh, you know, they didn't control the, the actual service like Twitter uh, because people were using unencrypted co communications. Uh, they could find out those people's usernames and passwords and then hack the accounts, find out who their friends were and so on. Uh, and actually one of the really interesting responses to that was that all of those services, Facebook, Twitter, and the, and the like, uh, all instituted uh, HTTPS, right, or secure web connections, which, trust me, is a heck of a lot more expensive uh, from the service side to do. Um, but it was deemed so incredibly important, and in fact, those types, that, um, uh, I mean, I remember the back channel that happened among the big service providers in order to be able to facilitate this, you know, literally happened in a number of days. Uh, and it was mobilized, uh, you know, by some protesters who had noticed it and, and were able to provide that information back um, through people like Dan. Um, so, you know, will there be other uh, challenges like that in the future? Certainly. Um, do we have to be careful in particular around you know, the local, uh, local laws where, you know, the governments might come in and say, hey, you know, you have to provide us with a list of information and names. Uh, and, and I think that that's absolutely a significant problem that exists. Um, and unfortunately is just a, 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 a by or a, an effect of the fact that, you know, these companies are all uh, located in sovereign states and that can do these things. Um, I think what, I, what it comes back to, in particular, if you live in a democracy and if the service is based in a democracy, I'm less concerned about it because those are exactly the kind of government abuses that then get corrected in future elections. Uh, and maybe I'm just optimistic and less cynical about it, but that's, that's my particular uh, uh, thought there. Um, I, am, I, I certainly think that the, the case uh, in China developing essentially its own internet inside, right, with its own social networking services, will lead to a uniquely Chinese solution. And I'm not, and, and I have to frankly say, I'm not an expert in China, um, but I think that the way that the Chinese government is actually handling the, these types of uh, uh, situations is extremely savvy for a government. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I think that it's actually very, very savvy. 
Um, so, I mean, where there is protest or where there are, you know, activities that people don't want to be surveilled on, we have the technologies that are available today and are pretty widely distributed. And I think that if there are additional abuses that occur, those types of technologies will get distributed more in the underground. So I think that that is the natural check or the natural balance to those more uh, 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 government abuses of power. I think that there's a separate question, which is around what I'll call little brother. Right, which are the you know the corporations themselves or even individuals. Right, Marshall McLuhan talked about the fact that in a global village, uh, you know, you also have a lot of gossip and everybody knows everything that's going on with all of their neighbors, and that's a little bit different. We live in a different world now, um, but anyway, that's a longer conversation. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Yeah, um, you know, uh, the it's a very good question. The, the thing that what I find very interesting is that different, different people here, everybody in this panel actually is uh, Peter, James, David, and Andrew. And I don't know whether this, we're, we're all, all have Christian names, but you know, this is, this is by a coincidence. Uh, I don't know about the social media from the political or the media side, but I see it from finance, which I know a little bit about. <clears throat> and I totally agree with James that Actually, regulation is not the right solution because regulators, by definition, is behind the curve. Okay? That, that we all accept. All bureaucracies, by definition, are behind the curve. Now, that creates a very serious problem if the system design is problematic. Now, let me give you a simple illustration. Why is it that volatility in financial markets are now higher than ever? Why is it that you know, suddenly UBS had a rogue trader at the same time, you know, very shortly after Sokgen also had a, a rogue trader, right? And they're not talking about chicken feed. Uh, as you know, in, uh, and, uh, you know, you, you, you know, there was one case where somebody poured coffee over their, uh, 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 what do you call it, the uh, keyboards. keyboards and triggered off a, a flash crash trade, right? Now, all these are you know, systemic issues. And you, know, you, you can't quite design to stop this. So you, it, it comes back to a key question. Has the system through technology evolved complexity far beyond individual and bureaucratic comprehension? And that's a very serious claim, right? I'll give you a simple illustration. On theory, you say financial markets should have zero friction. All engineers will tell you if you design a, you know, a, a spinning wheel with zero friction, it can spin so fast that the system will crash. But that's the theory for financial markets today, right? And so you, know, you have situations whereby the, the, the flash crash last year triggered off a, a, a mistake by one fund manager, triggered off 16% drop in the Dow Jones index. Okay? Now, can you imagine if, the, if we don't put in a circuit breaker, what could happen is that a series of these computer algorithms will throw the market more than 16%, right? Uh, now, you know, but that's designed into the system. And the regulators are saying, well, I don't understand this. Let me step back. Let me consult this. But by the time you consult, the crash would have already happened. That's, that's the kind of the design problems that we now face. And, and, and so, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy. I think what we really need to do, and unfortunately, you know, uh, my, the conclusion of my discussion earlier is that this, the world divided into silos national silos and departmental silos, academic silos, has created fallacies of composition which causes markets either to go uh, uh, over-optimistic or the fear group factor causes, you know, which is causing the high volatility, and at the same time, collective action traps. Look at the collective action trap today. Nobody dares to move. Because they don't dare to move because the governments have spent so much money uh, into debt that the, 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 the bullets left, the fiscal bullets left, are limited. They cannot move because they're in a completely new game. They don't know who should be moving first, right? And at the same time, 
the, the, the opinion is completely polarized, right? And so the, 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 the world today is, is got a collective action trap and it's no longer trend, it's actually two way. Now, let me explain this very, very carefully. Michael Spence, who is on our academic board, has written a new book called The Next Convergence. And what is the convergence? Is the global rebalancing we're seeing today, right? We're seeing that rich countries, the gap between the rich countries and the poor countries have narrowed considerably. But what is the great divergence at the same time? Within every single country, almost without exception, the difference, the gap between the rich and the poor have widened. So we have simultaneous global convergence and national divergence, okay? So it's actually yin and yang. For everything that's good, there is bad, and for everything that's bad, there's good. And you really need to begin to think about the problem in a systemic manner, very different from the old idea that just because there is a pain in your toe, you chop off your toe, and there's a pain in the head, you take an aspirin. It's not, it's the, the whole system changing in ways that we don't understand. And so therefore, you know, in my view, some of the ancient uh, 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 Asian kind of perspectives, which everybody thinks is yin yang, mysticism, etc., you know, is not completely wrong. And, and it's a different way of dealing with some of these issues, how to build system immunity rather than system fixes. And how do you build the system modularly so that actually when one system crashes, you can take out that, that, that modular function and to stop the whole system uh, breaking down. And, and so, you know, we really need to, to, to begin to examine all this from a very, very different perspective. I don't have the solutions. All I know is that we have to engage in the process, you know, to find out what is it that we really need, that we really don't understand. We really need a weak key solution that the, 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 the mass intelligence is better than any single person in dealing with this issue. Uh, Andrew, could I just, uh, following up from your remarks, go back to your initial uh, presentation in which you uh, suggested that one of the things that needs to be done is to try to understand the architecture of the system. But as you just pointed out, the system such as it is, is so complex that uh, hardly anybody knows even his part of uh, that uh, system of uh, systems. So does this suggest that in fact we may never be able to have a full understanding of the system and so we just have to learn to manage the risk and uh, uh, in a sense live with the uncertainties and imperfect knowledge of the system? Yeah, we need to, you know, when things are too complex, right, you need simplicity. But when it gets too simple, it is by definition wrong, right? I mean, you know, this, this, this is the contradiction in terms that we deal with. Let me give you a simple illustration. You know, uh, the 30 years of Chinese reforms, right, the West sees it in two phrases, crossing the river by feeling the stones and black cat, white cat. Now, you know, for every uh, 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 person who doesn't understand China, and there are not many people, you know, completely sort of accept this, even though I'm trying to study it, it says, well, so what? It's common sense. But it's actually trying to explain right at the basic level that crossing the river the fe by feeling the stones is that you're going on a journey nobody has gone before. You don't know how deep the water is. You don't know whether the stone is slippery. And you, even when you're in the middle of the river, you're not sure whether the shore is closer or further away because you don't know whether there's a flood that's going to take you away, right? Black cat, white cat means uh, uh, very pragmatic. But feeling the stones, if you use a Western theory to analyze this, the most economic theory and even simple physics theory is that that is random. But it's not random. Actually, you think about it, crossing the river by feeling the stones is actually extremely methodical. It's a process. You feel the stone, you pilot it, you experiment, you engage. Everybody knows 
whether that stone is safe, then you make the next step, right? But everybody thinks that if it's random, it, you, know, it, you know, anybody can go this. That's not the case. So we need to think about how do we explain to people by we have broadened the education so much that they all know Wiki, they all know Facebook, but they have difficulty understanding these very complex issues. How do you explain these complex issues in 140 characters? I challenge anybody to do it. But they know how to, they understand, like, don't, don't like. Right? And that can throw, throw down governments. So, you know, we, we, we are really in a very complex issue. I don't have that answers. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, some questions, uh, hopefully directed first at uh, Andrew Cheng. Okay, the lady in red, and then the gentleman behind her. Mr. Shank, thank you so much for, uh, for your presentation. It was really interesting. My name is Maria Ressa. I'm with uh, uh, RSIS at the using network theory for counterterrorism purposes. Um, you talked about a paradigm shift, um, and I think it's scarcity versus abundance. Um, more and more of less and less. The guy who wrote it was Chris Anderson, and he was talking about businesses. Um, the same for journalists, more and more of less and less, and then the impact on people. Um, how do you think this is fundamentally changing the way people think? Uh, how is it people who are on social media, for example, how is that changing the way they think? And then to the other panelists, um, the dumbing down, television supposedly did that, but the internet is now shrinking it to 140 characters. How do we prevent it from becoming the cult of the amateur? I don't know, to tell the truth. I interviewed uh, a young, you know, uh, born after 80s uh, 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 graduate, very, very bright. And I asked her, what do you care about? And she says, green technology. I care about the earth being very green. I said, fantastic. I said, we're a non-profit organization. We don't pay you very much. There's no problem. I work for you. And then I asked a second question. If Goldman Sachs offer you a job, would you go? She said instantly, yes. <laughs> so there you are. You know, contradiction in terms, right? Uh, 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 how the hell do we now deal with very different value systems uh, from a, 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 an intergenerational issue? We, you know, some of us, uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, still feel that we should work on you know, public service, etc. But others feel that they can get rich very, very quickly. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, so in my view, I think uh, how do you inculcate and communicate intergenerationally is the biggest challenge. I think the biggest divergence that we are facing is the divergence between the baby boomers like myself who uh, marched in the streets in 1968 protesting against our earlier generation, today not understanding the new generation which is completely thinking very, very differently. And until we bridge that gap, you know, accidents will happen. And I think, I think that's, that's the problem that we face. Sorry. I, I'm sorry, excuse me, I, I have to run. And uh, so I really enjoyed this and thank you very much. So I'm sorry thank, I can't uh, participate further. Thank, thank you. you very much. David. Uh, you know, so I, I take a different view than Andrew on this particular, uh, on this particular note. I actually think that uh, the, the generation of young people who, who I have met, uh, that there's an extraordinary sense of civic engagement, that there's an extraordinary sense uh, of willingness and the need to create change, create global change, and to create it now. Um, and of course there's going to be people who go to work, you know, for whoever, for the most money they can get. That's never changed. But that there's a sense of idealism, there's a sense of empowerment, and that there's a sense of dedication um, and real results that actually come out of it. Uh, you know, one, just one friend of mine, a guy named Joe Green, who actually was Mark Zuckerberg's roommate at Harvard, uh, who decided not to go that way, but created a company called Causes, which is the, the largest personal fundraising site on the internet, um, with uh, over 
35 million active members. Uh, and these are people who are organizing themselves, whether it's giving to their local ASPCA or it's uh, you know, doing marathons to help stop cancer or it's uh, you know, helping fight uh, homelessness in big cities to you know, helping bring uh, you know, goats to people in Africa. It's you, know, you name it. If you have a cause, if you have a particular uh, uh, you know, if, yeah, if you have a cause that you want to get uh, you know, seen and, have, and you can now involve your friends and rec get your friends recognition, they get recognition when, when they give. I mean, it's, it's just a very different way of looking at the problem. It's not so top-down anymore. And just because it isn't the old way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. Yeah, just uh, two, re <clears throat> sorry, two remarks. I think one in terms of the dumbing down. In many ways, I think the dumbing down was taking place, uh, in fact, long before the Internet. It goes back to when U.S. News and World produced the phrase of news that you can use. Uh, with other words, the fact that the media increasingly were catering to what they thought people wanted rather than to what they thought was important and people should know was really the, the beginning of the, the dumbing down. And you can argue that, <clears throat> and in many ways that's true, I think, that things get reduced to 140 characters, but they also get expanded from those 140 characters. Those 140 characters are very often simply a lead, a tip, a link to something that's much more lengthy, much more profound. So I think it's something that actually does cut both ways. Thank you. Uh, first, I have, uh, I'll have you next, but I have a gentleman uh, first behind. Yes, then I'll come to you. Well, this is a question I had intended to ask uh, Andrew. So I tried uh, running after him, but he was running faster than I was. Uh, he, I, I thought he was saying something very important, which I wanted to understand better as a layman, um, at the risk of uh, sounding superfluous, uh, I'd like to impose on the panel on two small uh, related questions on cybercrime and on, the, on technology as a resource for peacekeeping and warfare. On cybercrime, <clears throat> some analysts suggest that the take from cybercrime is now larger than the take from organized crime, um, illegal traffic in drugs and arms. So the first question is what should governments be doing to combat this problem? Uh, the second related question <clears throat> Uh, is uh, about uh, technology as a resource for uh, peacekeeping and warfare. We have discussed, uh, we have heard a lot about the first. On the second, uh, many rich and powerful countries are now entering the particularly delicate demographic phase where one day they probably no longer have sufficiently uh, strong standing armies to fight their wars, to man their warships, aircraft, uh, even their uh, ground stations. They'll have to rely increasingly on unmanned aerial, maritime, and probably uh, ground systems controlled by computers. Is this uh, scenario uh, too far out? If it is not, what then should governments be doing? Thank you. Uh, okay, maybe I can, uh, who wants to take this first? James, you go first. <laughs> uh, there are two questions. One is about uh, cybercrime. Uh, the second one, is it possible to envisage uh, a, a situation in the future in which warfare is conducted uh, entirely through uh, unmanned systems because we just don't have enough uh, people and perhaps this also saves on uh, uh, precious sons of the soil, so to speak. Uh, so, so these are the two questions. I mean, the, the question of the cyber crime is a question that 
certainly already in terms of uh, counterterrorism plays a major role. I think there's no doubt that in some ways maybe if you wanted to formulate that we have two lives and we have two worlds. We have a physical world and we have a virtual world. And as much as I agree with Peter at the end of that, that certainly in terms of freedom of expression, uh, it should be largely an unregulated world. Obviously there is going to have to be regulation and that brings in when it comes to cyber uh, crime, but also to the uh, defense issue that you, that you brought, it brings in a whole host of security issues. The one thought that occurred to me in terms of the question about are we going to be controlled in defense by, uh, uh, by technology rather than by human input is the question of which has come up with drones. At what point does, at, at what point, uh, or is there actually a point where humans are no longer necessary in some ways? The fact of the matter is if you look at intelligence, we're starting to learn that humans are very, very necessary, that uh, the technical intelligence is simply insufficient. And I think that we're going to find that on defense too. Yes, I think we're going to see enormous technological advance, as we've seen in with, robot, with, or with, with drones. But it's going to be, at the end of the day, with that drone, it is the human being who directs it, who targets it, who takes that decision that counts. And I think that was going to remain. Thank you, David. Yeah. Um, so I'm not an expert in cybercrime. Uh, I used to be uh, a bit more in my past. Uh, so frankly, I'm a little surprised at some analysts saying that it's larger than organized crime. In my experience, cybercrime is organized crime, right? That in fact, it's directed by the organized crime syndicates. And if it's not, then it actually has created new organized crime syndicates. I think that you're still dealing with um, a relatively sophisticated group of well-funded, uh, organized individuals who, you know, who are committing much, much of this crime. That's been my understanding of it. Um, and so, you know, the problem is that it's also transnational and it's moving fast. Uh, and that certainly is a, is a key issue that I think actually governments have a very significant role in addressing around the investigation and cooperation in order to be able to, uh, to coordinate both on a regulatory framework as, you know, in terms of what exactly is cybercrime, uh, as well as a legal framework. Uh, and, and at that, I'm sort of approaching the end of my particular expertise there, so I don't want to misinform. Um, with regards to um, the second question around defense, um, you know, I am a trained computer scientist, and I do play one on television. And in that, I'll say that the whole concept of artificial intelligence is an oxymoron, right? It just doesn't work very well, right? We have not yet gotten close to being able to create the kind of decision-making capabilities that a human being is able to make and understanding subtleties uh, and understanding, uh, you know, information and misinformation and so on, right? We have a term in computer science called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. And when you're making decisions that will potentially terminate human lives, um, it generally helps and is a lot smarter to be able to have a human being in that loop somewhere. Now, does that mean that he has to be the guy who's flying the plane, you know, and making the decision in the cockpit? Maybe not. Uh, and will there certainly be advances? You know, does that mean that he has to be the guy or she has to be the gal who's standing there disarming the bomb instead of doing it 100 and, you know, 100 miles away over telepresence? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but will there be humans out of the loop? Because don't forget, the other aspect in terms of a defense scenario is, what happens when your communications channel is subverted? Uh-oh, that's bad. So I, I, I'm, I'm less uh, bullish on this concept of, you know, uh, a significantly reduced or, you know, automated defense force. Uh, I think that we will certainly continue to see automation uh, and perhaps, you know, a, a change in where the actual human being is, but will there be human beings in that loop and as a significant part of that decision process? 
I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Thank you. Uh, one question, another one, and a third one. Okay, you, you sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Um, Professor Ken Morgan from the University of Western Australia. It's interesting listening to the panel talk about the issues of cyber. I come from the military, ARPNET, the, the whole transition of um, the issues of the internet world and the world that working with a lot of governments over the years right from 96 onwards about the change of laws when it comes down to cyber signatures you know from the OECD to the IMF to the World Bank everybody was caring about opening an access to the internet but it was a developing country called the Philippines that showed us when it came down to the first thing of that 140 characters, it brought down a president with the power of the thumb. I mean, not many people have remembered that uh, Estrada was brought down by the Filipinos um, by the power of the thumb. And we, yes, we have seen the issues of North Africa when it comes down to the issues of social networking. But in some of the largest financial institutions I deal with these days and some of the largest corporations I talk about, and we could do scenario planning these days. It's all about not what is happening today, but what is going to happen in the next five years and 10 years that large Fortune 500 corporations and governments need to look at. London is a great concern because they use wireless networks of, of mobile phones. We will reach a point in Olympics that they'll shut down the network. The Toronto, they did it at the, the G20 meetings. So, when there is a crisis like 9-11, we will face a decision by governments where the rules will change. Trust me. And it will come out of the financial markets because they're under immense threat of what is happening to the cyber crimes. And, and I've never heard that number ever thrown that it is greater than um, normal crime. Except we are facing situations with hacking, which is gaining competitive advantages to nation states and organizations to find out what bidding is. Because at the end, we do not go to war to kill people. We go to war and to gain competitive economic supply chain advantage. Okay, any uh, reaction to that? Uh, I, I, would, I would agree with that, basically. Yeah, well, thank you for the validation on the, on the, on the figure around uh, the, the crime figures. I, I, I think that, um, I mean, in my hometown, in San Francisco, they just recently, the BART, which is the local transportation system, uh, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, uh, did a mobile phone shutoff because they had heard that there was going to be a protest, right, about some recent issues around the, the killing of, uh, of a... Uh, uh, of a civilian uh, by a BART police officer. And so it's caused a tremendous stir and a lot of protest. And, and I think that's your, your point around governments changing the rules, right, in times of national emergency is absolutely apt. And I think uh, one of the questions here also is just, so how, does, how do we as an informed citizenry help to have those conversations now before those crises erupt and come up with um, reasonable solutions that can deal with the exigency, the ex exigency, but also uh, protect civil rights. Thank you. I think, the, the, of course, the worry is if the governments uh, step in, uh, a point which had been made uh, before is that governments, when they regulate, it's, it's a very blunt instrument in, in the uh, cyber world. And uh, then you risk uh, not just uh, dealing with the problem of uh, cyber crime, but you may also regulate to the point that you kill off the economic uh, potential of the internet, and the internet by and large has been a, a positive uh, force for the world, economic terms, in, in social terms. So I think this obviously is one of the uh, big challenges that we face. If I, if I can just make one f yes. quick comment on that, which is the flip side of all of this, of course, is what happened in Iran earlier this year, or, or in 2009, or what happened in Egypt earlier this year, where you actually tried to shut down the whole system in order to squash the protest, which in Iran to a degree worked, in Egypt didn't. 
But that's the flip side of, and that's not what you're yeah. talking about, uh, I realize. One of the, the key issues comes down to, sorry, as a supplement, is the issues when it comes down to, there are mechanisms in play. Bill Clinton um, brought in a group, and there was dealing with critical infrastructure, I forget the, the, the number it was, but you know, Craig Monday, who's the mm -hmm. chief strategist for Microsoft, John Gage, the old guys were all brought in, and there's a group of us sat and we worked through. There are protocols in place within the US, there are protocols in other countries. We're reaching a point where those will be initiated to bring down the networks in order to protect. 9-11 changed the way we travel. We're coming to a point when it comes down to especially financial markets that the systems will be brought down in order to protect the greater whole. Thank you. Uh, gentleman there, and then I've got uh, Sergei. And then uh, one more. Yes, my name is Pong Sakunagun from Sasin of Julangorn, New City, Bangkok. I have one conjecture that's bowing my mind. Perhaps I would try to elaborate to you, and I would like the panelists to uh, comment on it. Uh, the thing that I, I'm a financial economist, so I tend to, every time I hear about free flow information, it's always bowed back to free capital, free market economy and all this. And then one thing that's come to my mind is that a lot have to do with maturity in digital life. Each one of us have different maturity. You and me, Thailand as a nation, you know, Singapore as a nation, and thing in Iran, Iraq or whatever in America have different maturity. It's like a child. If the child go up, they don't go to kindergarten, learn to be creative, then it's something else. Then when you go up to uh, secondary school, then you have to be disciplined a bit. Then you uh, bachelor degree and all so forth, you know. It's like life circle. Then I tend to think, like in the past, those who have more maturity is always take advantage of those who are immature, whatever it is. So, what's wrong with it? If you ha we're going to have social mentor, you know, social uh, certifier, somebody who come in and try to uh, verify on whether this is information, this misinformation, this is fake, what's wrong with it? Sometimes we have to shut down a network due to greater good because of this difference in maturity in digital life. Can you please comment on this? Thank you. Well, I, I guess the question is, uh, can we uh, have our cake and eat it? Uh. The main question is, each one of us and each nation have different development in uh, digital life. So, with different sort of stage, you know, in this maturity in digital life, if you don't have different rule and different regulation, it would be like financial crisis going on in 1907 in, in Thailand, for example, yeah. let alone 2008 in, uh, in Great Recession. Thank you. Well, anybody wants to try to respond to that question or comment? If I understood the question correctly, I think that one, there's the, what you're talking about is, <clears throat> is differences in what you, what you described of maturity in approach towards new technology. Is that correct? Differentiated regulation. Uh, and you put it in terms of one's personal experience as individuals, as communities. I mean, I would argue that then as much as it is personal and, you know, as we as persons need to go through the experience, so do communities of whatever size and whatever nature. Um, the question then also arises when you, in terms of the need to shut down, as, as you mentioned, that given the degree of interconnectivity that these new technologies provide, to what degree can you shut down one community rather than the whole, and what happens then? I mean, those, those I think are the two, two things that I would raise. Uh, I think, you know, my, the gut, my gut feeling is that that's actually an incredibly paternalistic 
somewhat elitist view. Um, I, I think that people are, you know what, we're adults, right? And, and you know, we have the right to make decisions on, for ourselves. And um, uh, I think that it is a dangerous attitude when we start taking into our own hands the power that we know better. Uh, and so that concerns me. And maybe I just misinterpreted your question, and if so, let's talk about it afterwards, uh, because I, I didn't mean to insult. But I'm, I, I do get worried about um, an attitude that, uh, that I've seen elsewhere, <laughs> that, um, you know, especially as the, you know, the educated elite, like our responsibility is not to you know control or keep the keep the the populace passive i think our control our our responsibility is to educate and to empower uh and the more that we can do that the stronger the society will have as a whole just just to uh, make a couple more points uh, as i understand it today uh, many countries have their own set of uh, regulations to regulate the internet and it is not uh, uniform, uh, uh, the way the internet is regulated in these countries. But the limits to that kind of regulation is that it's only confined to what they can do within their country, but it's in the very nature of the internet that it is uh, a, a global system and a lot of the activity that takes place does not take place within your national boundaries where your regulations apply, but take place outside. So unfortunately, if you're going to uh, regulate globally, then it has to be uniform uh, global regulation, perhaps some differentiation for, as you say, levels of maturity, but I, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's really achievable to have uh, too much differentiation if indeed there is an agreement on some form of uh, global regulation. Uh, I've got Sergey there. Yep. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm Sergei Karaganov from Russia. Now, um, uh, it has become a common truth or common knowledge that uh, in internet and social network is empowering people and even facilitating revolution. It was reflected. Um, uh, this notion was reflected uh, here. Uh, I would um, pose, uh, I would put forward a, a different notion and uh, ask for your reaction. Uh, first of all, I've, I completely agree with, uh, with James that, of course, the so-called um, Arab Spring revolutions, or they were not revolutions actually, they, didn't, they changed nothing there, uh, were not a result of, uh, uh, mostly not a result of uh, social net network, uh, of uh, uh, internet networking, but mostly it was a normal revolt, which was somewhat quickened and facilitated by uh, networking. I mean, it is, we have had that, I mean, over, uh, over decades in the Arab world, and we have had uh, such revolutions when, uh, when there was no even telephone connections. Let me remind you of the greatest revolutions we have had. I am, uh, my country is a victim of them, well, one of the worst of them. There was no internet and there was very, very little of telephone connections at that time. Uh, but my suspicion and my uh, uh, is that uh, that, so, uh, that social networks and internet uh, works in a different and opposite way. It provides first, it provides uh, for a false feeling of participation. If you browse through social network, you will see how much hatred, negativism is there. People, I mean feel that they uh, protest. Actually, they influence nothing. But, uh, 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 but internet provides and social networks provide uh, for kind of a vent, for kind of a uh, safety wolf for these kind of uh, feelings. And I must say that maybe, and I want to hear your reaction, it is exactly because of this new c communications technologies that a lot of revolutions are not happening. And not are not happening, and a lot of revolts are not happening. And second notion is that I know of certain uh, uh, authoritarian governments, which are using internet and, and, and new technologies very wisely, in order exactly to direct uh, these kind of grievances. For example, throwing in for 
false issues into uh, the public agenda, a lot, then, then uh, uh, provoking a lot of negative uh, um, uh, reaction, and then yielding as you, though they never intend. And that, has, that is being done in many countries. I know one at least where it is done regularly. And, and uh, people feel that they are influenced, I think. While they're absolutely doing nothing, then they are actually, actually, actually it's a farcical democracy, I would say, or pseudo-democracy. So my question is, uh, do, uh, uh, my question, does, I mean, their social network provide for actual participation, or does it provide for a false sense of participation? Thank you. But the question is whether that's mutually exclusive. I mean, I would agree with you in many ways, and at the same time argue that the opposite is true also. With other words, um, is it a distraction? Is it a release valve? Uh, and does it distract maybe from what, what real issues are? Is it a platform in which uh, attention, attention can be directed in certain ways? Absolutely. And yet, at the same time, it is a medium that one has to take serious. It is a medium where, whether it's corporate or government, uh, image counts, and you have to respond. And it is a medium where, at, one point, at some points, the groundswell is such that it forces change. And all of that may be contradictory, in, uh, but it's not mutually exclusive. With other words, it's a medium with very many facets and very many faces and therefore uh, can be used in very many different ways, often even, uh, perhaps even contradictory. What is the balance? Is there a balance? Does, I mean, and, and even if there is a balance, isn't that a balance that shifts all the time? It's dynamic. And what's happening on that platform is changing all the time. So is there a, it, it, yes, there is a balance, but that balance really is a snapshot. All right, I have time for just one more question. It's your question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Joel Curry from RSIS. Um, I just have a question about um, the, the perception of this as a, you guys use the word threat all the time. Um, for young people, you, talked, you touched on it earlier with an earlier question um, that young people are the ones using social media the most and that young people see it as a tool. So saying that social media is a threat, it, it creates this feeling of uh, that young people therefore are a threat. So would you say that when you speak of solutions to this threat of social media and new technology, that integration and engagement of the youth would lessen the perceived threat of social media? I mean in, in Egypt, for example, young people um, young, large demographic of young people, educated but unemployed and largely kept out of the system. So would it, if they were engaged more, would the threat of social media be reduced? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should perhaps first ask uh, David to respond because I think he made it very clear that there are huge opportunities uh, in the social media. Perhaps you could uh, supplement your comment. Sure, you know, right on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that you know your point is direct and absolutely to the point, right? That what you, the reason why it's perceived as a threat is because you know the people who are in power don't understand it, and the way to to absolve that from being a threat and take advantage of the enormous opportunity that you already understand so well is to you know is partly through education, and partly through quite frankly generation change. Right, this is, this is partly just gonna happen because people are gonna be leaving and you're, you're the next generation of leaders, right? And what I would suggest along that front is, you know, go out there and do it, right? I mean, that there are, there are already people who are doing this and you know the power that sits in your hands with almost no capital requirement, a good idea, some organization and energy, an enormous positive change can happen, whether it's you know, somebody like Jen Palka at Code for America, right, who has basically created a technology peace corps for municipalities. I mean, and that was just, it was an idea. 
let's go find it and let's go build it. And she got herself some funding and now they have dozens of projects for cities and municipalities around the United States where young coders and you know, people who understand social media who are coming and working on you know, the, the kinds of projects to help the inner cities in, in the United States, right? And why not expand that? Why not, l let's, let's do that all around the world, right? Or, you know, like what Joe Green is doing over at Causes, right, that I talked about earlier. But, you know, so be part of that change. And, and you know, if you're, if you're afraid of it, you know, reach out and, and learn something about it. You know, there are, there's an extraordinary generation that is coming of age that is motivated and energized to be able to build great things. All they need is a little bit of help and a little bit of guidance. Thank you. James, any uh, last yeah, words just, on this? Just very briefly, I, I would agree with what David said, and I'll bow to your, your memory. Uh, I don't recall using the word threat. On, on the contrary, I think that I viewed it very much, certainly in the context of Egypt, as an enabler, and, and in terms of uh, enabler for change, change that was indeed youth-driven, but change that also was, uh, without doubt, necessary and 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 positive. So if I if if that was not in, understood, then I uh, apologize. <laughs> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have come to the end of a very rich session. Although we are down to only two panelists, I think you will agree that they've uh, given us a lot of food for thought. We should also thank Andrew Sheng, who who unfortunately had to. Uh, leave a bit early. So on that note, uh, let's thank our panelists in the traditional fashion. Okay. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Peter Ho, and all our panelists for the insightful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of all the panel discussions for the Singapore Global Dialogue 2011. I would now like to invite Ambassador Barry Desker back on stage to deliver his closing remarks. Ambassador Desker, please. Uh, good evening. I know that I stand between you and a welcome drink in the evening. But we have come to the end of the second Singapore Global Dialogue. Uh, we are privileged to have had this opportunity to interact with you and to, and to learn from some of the leading minds in their respective fields. We've met when the world is on a cusp of change. Lord Mandelson highlighted the challenges facing the Eurozone. And he also made the point that the political economy of globalization is under stress. Our first panel took up the shifting balance of power. My good friend Kisho Mabubani, in his usual provocative style, highlighted the return of Asia and observed that European domination was a historical aberration. The th key theme that surfaced during, the panel on, uh, during this panel discussion was the question of security assurances among the great powers in Asia. As Ambassador Sandy Rand put it, those equipped with great power tend to be laden with great responsibilities. His counterparts from Russia, Singapore, and China agreed but deferred on how security among specific rim states should be implemented. One view was that ASEAN, however, might be the silent hero in pioneering a path towards peace and stability. President Kalam's luncheon address focused on how technological solutions to planetary problems such as energy shortages, literacy, and jobs could bring humanity together at a confluence of civilizations. To apply technological solutions for a democratic world order, enlightened leadership in the service of universal human needs 
have to be practiced. In the second panel, uh, we, we had Ambassador Nabil Fahmi, who observed the need, uh, the need to change the norms of global governance, not just to maintain, and that we need not just maintain the balance of power paradigm with different powers. The view in the panel was that we had a glass which was half empty, as Ralph Emmers put it, in our approach uh, to global governance. Global governance, while complex, ought not to be mission impossible, but it should be a pragmatic venture. We then went on to the third panel, which uh, uh, discussed the challenges posed by the new trends and emerging technologies. Inclu and here, we actually return to the focus of the opening address by Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien, where he stressed that there was a need to create a secure cyber environment. Interestingly enough, uh, what we had done at this conference was to experiment. Uh, we took an approach unusual in conferences of this nature by having a third panel on new trends and emerging technologies. And we put together a panel with diverse backgrounds. The question in our minds was, could a meaningful conversation take place among speakers with such diverse backgrounds. Similarly, President Kalam was invited, as he had made his reputation as a nucle nuclear and space scientist, but he has increasingly explored civilizational issues and humanist perspectives. The issue which we wanted to put before you was, how do we think outside the box? Can we stretch our imaginations? Are there new ways at, of looking at old problems? We felt that if we helped to push the envelope, it would result in a conference where we, as participants, would leave with food for thought and, ass and assessments which questioned our assumptions. On behalf of the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, I would like once again to thank our principal sponsor, Tomasek International, uh, for its ongoing support of the Singapore Global Dialogue. Without their support, we would not have been able to host this event. I would also like to thank our other sponsors, Wilma International, Hotel Properties, the Shangri-La Hotel, and the Singapore Tourism Board. I would also like to thank our speakers for taking time off their busy schedules for, uh, to join us uh, yesterday and today. Finally, I would like to thank my RSIS colleagues for their hard work behind the scene. While I was the face of the organization, without their sterling efforts over the past six months, we would not have been able to organize this second uh, Singapore Global Dialogue. May I ask you to join me in thanking my colleagues. <laughs> Finally, I look forward to welcoming you again next year for the third Singapore Global La Dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Barry Desker.